one of the most fun things about doing a knife like this is I just have an idea. I started with a round bar of steel and I just started forging. I started just sculpting this blade out. So one of the concepts was it's like, I didn't necessarily want to make it an integral, but I did want to have a place where I, when I'm grinding my handle material, it stops and starts right here. And I'm going to totally cover that with handle material. Uh, I, I had the idea, maybe I wanted to do an Edo wrap, but it, when I was thinking about it last night, I was like, man, I really want to do like a faceted, some kind of cool, something more fun, you know, a little more uh, visually interesting. So instead of just smooth grips. So I'm going to leave a lot of the forging. We are going to go back in here and uh, do some grinding and we'll clean some of this up, but we're going to try and leave as much forging as possible. So next is drill some holes, grind the blade, and then we'll be ready to heat treat. Okay, so one of the things I'd like to share with you is drilling holes and drill bits. So I don't buy drill bits from the hardware store. I get them in packages of 12 usually. This is for drilling quarter inch holes, but it's not a quarter inch bit. It's a number, it's a, it's a letter F bit, which is slightly over a quarter inch. So if you have a piece of material that's 0.250, the drill bit you buy at the hardware store is going to drill a 0.249 hole and it's not perfectly round. You either need to drill that hole and then ream it with a reamer because um, a two flute drill doesn't drill a perfectly round hole. It drills kind of a weird, maybe triangular shaped hole. That's hard to see, but if, you, if you're drilling in metal and you start trying to fit these things together, they don't fit. They need to be reamed or in knife making because we're not making helicopter parts. Uh, this isn't necessarily the most precision type of metalworking that you can do or need to do. Um, I just get a slightly bigger bit. So this is, I think um, we can measure it and see. Two, five, eight, I believe. I will measure it. So you know, they might say it on the box, but that doesn't mean I trust it. So. 0.254, so that's what an F is, 0.254. So that's a, just a little bit over, and it seems to work perfectly for the holes. I also use uh, eight inch bits. Those are the two I most commonly use. I don't use a lot of other sizes. It's just like what I like. I like the quarter inch for either lanyard holes or tubing or pins, and I like eighth inch. Uh, Different pins give different effect. Uh, sometimes when I do hidden tang knives, I don't even use a pin, but that's because I put something else in there and you can't get that out. So that's another story, right, for another video. But this is a, a number 30, which is just over eighth of an inch. But you can buy these in packages of 12. They end up being maybe $2 a piece, maybe $1.90 a piece, I'm not sure. Same thing with these. It's, not, it's a lot less expensive and you get a higher quality drill bit. Uh, this is from Bassinol, that's because it's around the corner. And this is from MSC. MSC is like Acme Tool and Supply. Like if you order it early in the morning, you could get it that afternoon. So just something to help you make things better. Sometimes when you're forging and you're trying to get a blade straight, especially when you forge it this close, you get some something weird happened and it's a little bit of a twist, but I normalized this thing twice. This is 1085, so I know I can go back and basically just hammer on this and get that little bit of a weird thing out, which is throwing me off just like a 32nd or something. And when you're looking over I don't know, what is that, 12 inches or so, and you're out of 30 seconds, it's very obvious. So that's fixed now, it looks good. We're gonna, I'm gonna do a little more grinding and then we're gonna heat treat. Okay, so I have got the grinding done. Um, it's always interesting to see where this grinding goes here when you do forging like this. So over on this side, you can see I have a, a 
pretty good hammer blow, but I like that. That's going to be cool. I'll grind this a little bit more. This won't be sharp, sharp. It'll seem like it's almost sharp. And uh, when I get done with this blade, the idea will be I'll leave as much forging as possible. And um, I'll go back and, and uh, sand some more. We'll get a little finer finish on it. Now, here's an interesting thing. When I started forging blades, I was told like the knife has to be finished to above 120 degrees, I mean 120 grit grinds, or you're causing stress risers that will cause the steel to crack. Now, uh, that was a long time ago, and what I have found since then is that is not necessarily true. And here's why my hypothesis, okay? When you normalize the blade properly, when, the, when you forge properly under the right temperatures, uh, you won't get cracks. If you don't forge under the right temperatures, you will get cracks. So I think what happened was, back in the day or whenever, or whenever you start playing with this, you're forging at very different ranges. And you're using, maybe you're using certain steels. Maybe you used 01, whatever. That steel tends to want to crack red hard. Um, all depending on the steel and it doesn't matter how fine you finish it but let's just say one day one guy sanded to 36 grit already had cracks in the blade quenched the blade the blade cracked on one of the lines and went oh look see um, it cracked because it had 36 grit uh, grinds in it that I have never found that to be true ever um, since I've gone through this current process of heat treating that I'm in now this might change I might I hope to improve it actually I hope to get better and better at it but I usually grind to 36 and then heat treat I've never had a blade crack because of this so I'm gonna have to throw that hypothetical view of that out uh, I think the combinations are many you can't just take one variable and say this is why it was destroyed when you're not really considering all the other ones. So, can you grind to 36 grit, normalize, heat treat, harden, temper? Yes. Um, will you get a crack in your blade if you do this? Uh, my experience, based on what I'm doing right now, is no. But if I use, let's just say I used a different steel. Let's say I used this steel, 80 CRV2. Oh, this ain't 80 CRV2. This is 1084. 1085 Hitachi sign. Um, and I, I have a train in the background. I use 1085 Hitachi here. I just forged it. I go over, grind it. Immediately I bring it up to 1500 degrees. I want to austenize and then I quench. Well, I left out a, a good many steps and hours of heat treating time. And I just went right to hardening. Can it crack then? Yes. Will it? Probably. I don't know. Maybe. There's a lot of stress in the blade. So there's a lot of things. It, there are variables you have to eliminate. Um, and when you eliminate them, you'll start to see, wow, I'm getting better results. Because now you're thermal cycling. Now you're normalizing. Now you're getting proper temperatures in your heat treat. You're not just working around in some um, coal or your forwards that may be too hot and then quenching in whatever media, I don't know. You know, so I know exactly what I'm quenching in. I got AAA. I'm gonna bring it exactly up to 1500 degrees. Um, before all that happened, I forged within the temperature ranges of forging for this piece of steel between 2000 uh, down to, you know, as low as about 1200. But I didn't beat it cold. You know, I didn't, I wasn't forging on a cold. And those are things you have to eliminate. That's some of the simple things that make you a better bladesmith. What's happening inside the steel that you can't see. So that was a lot of talking just to get to the point of, I grind to 36 and then I harden most of the time. Sometimes I go a little finer. It all depends on what it is. But this is 36 and now I'm going to do one more normalizing and then I'm going to harden. So that's a total of three normalizing and one hardening. All right, so what I'm going to do now is uh, this is my last normalize and I'm going to pull it out make sure it's all straight 
and then when it gets down to room temperature, we'll put it back in the forge, I mean in, in the kiln, bring it up to 1500 degrees and quench. So if I need to straighten it, I'm, I got all my tools here, hammer, tongs, all that I can straighten. So this is how I pull it out when I'm using this kiln, this is important. So I'm grabbing the blade, I'm pulling it out, dumping the pin, and then I can come over here like this, and I can have a look and make sure I'm all straight. And it's one of the hardest things probably is making sure the blade's straight, or keeping the blade straight. That's what I like about using the, um, the, the leg vise for this process because it flexes a little bit. You know, it's, it has a little bit of a flex to it, which is really nice. Okay, so next is quenching. So after I quench, and I'm going to show you a cool way to heat your oil up because you probably haven't used this technique before. So this is AAA, and instead of heating a bar of steel up and putting it in here and making a big fire and breaking down the viscosity of my quench oil. Uh, I'm going to heat it up like this. Uh, the most important part about this right here is having a solid stand, having a, a steel tube, solid stand. This can't tip over. It takes a lot of work to tip this over uh, because that oil is flammable. And if you spill that in your shop and you light it on fire, your shop will burn down. It's bad news. It's really bad. So be careful. I want to get the oil up to about 130 degrees. So I'll show you this thing real quick while we're waiting on that. Very nice. All right. So you see, we're heating the oil up. Um, don't just have it in a tube and lean it over. You know, make it safe. Make this simple and safe. The more, more you simplify things, the better it's going to get. Don't make it more complicated. Make it more simple. All right. So here's another cool thing. When you heat up a long blade like this, kitchen knife, any kind of knife, chef's knife. Sword. This is um, a big knife. This is about a 14-inch blade. It ain't really a sword, but it's just a big knife. So after I've quenched this, and it's below 400 degrees, and I pull it out of the quench and I wipe it off, I'm gonna put it in this in this wood right here. I'm gonna put it in the vise and clamp it really tight. If there is any warping in it, usually this keeps it from warping, it straightens it right out, pulls the little bit of heat left out of it. Um, I found that this works well for longer blades, it works great for swords, um, so you can do it or not do it, but it seems to work good for me. Just two pieces of two by four, eventually they'll get worn out and you can replace them. Um, you could put something on them to hold them together if you want, you could, you could strap them together with leather or a hinge or whatever. Uh, I just basically open this big enough to stick it in there and you have a very short window of opportunity to straighten the blade after hardening. Um, not much time but you still can. Um, the bad experiences I've had are breaking the blade because <laughs> I was torquing it too much. So that has happened. Alright, so now 
and that cools down enough, we're going to go back in and we'll, we'll harden. So because this is going to be a, a lot more impact on this piece, um, I'm going to temper it a little bit hotter than normal. So we're going to temper this at about 400 degrees. I usually don't go over 400 for many things, but because I think we're going to have a lot of chopping, you know, it's going to be, I'll be using it, but I'm, all, I'm more than likely sell this piece. And uh, I just want to make sure that it doesn't get damaged and its intended use is chopping and cutting and clearing trails. It's a chopper camp knife, you know. So, could use it for hogs if you wanted to poke hogs. It would work really, really well. All right, so let's see what we're at. Let's shoot it. 122. That's pretty good. When it's cold, um, I always want to get it above 120. 130 is a little better, so I'll run this just a little bit more. The whole purpose of doing this is so you don't have to take a hot piece of steel, stick it in there, make a big fire, and basically you break down the, the effectiveness of the oil over time. You keep heating it and getting it caught on fire, you're going to break it all down, and you don't want to do that. So we'll get a little hotter. Ideally, I want above 130. We'll be transforming austenite into martensite. Okay. I got this rag. This is in case I have to sneeze while I'm doing this. So I can sneeze in that. I'm going to grab with these tongs, dump the pin, quench in that oil, wipe it off, put it over here, and make it all work. And hopefully, we won't have any explosions. Sometimes, you could get into the right quantum realm, and uh, if you do this, you could have uh, splitting atoms, and you could have some weird catastrophic, you could fold space uh, and never even know you did it. So, okay, that's a joke, I'm joking. That's none of that true. This is true, though. This is the real as it gets, all right? So we will grab the blade. Dump the pin like that and go back in there like that. We're doing this a little bit of jostling here, agitating it, you know. And that whole thing about quenching true north is not true. <laughs> you can if you want to. It does, it does, it is fun to do things like that. It's just not necessary. Alright. Wipe it off. Check it real quick. Look straight. Just to ensure straightness. Going like this. Going right into here. Going right into here like this. Probably never seen that before, but, yep. Okay, so next part is tempering. All these, all these steps for heat treating are really what make the difference between a great blade and a mediocre blade. So if you want a great blade, that great blade could have forge marks, it could have bad grinding on it, but it has an awesome heat treat. I think about the old Ruana knives, Rudy Ruana, he made really awesomely heat treated knives way back in the day. They weren't gorgeous or pretty, but they had a reputation for being tough um, uh, and high quality, and uh, maybe for, you know, for their time, uh, they, were, they were great. Um, I've actually had one or two of them. They're not super pretty, but they are, they are well made. There we go. So I'm just going to give that a second. Wipe this off. This is going to be a fun knife. One of the things about all these blades, these big blades are always like, in my mind, I always love the idea of the big blade, just this big primal chopping knife. I grew up in a a swamp and I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time deeper in the swamp in a place called Fidler Forest uh, down behind my cousin's property in Wiggins Lake 
and there are trees in there that have never been logged. There, it's a primeval forest. I mean, these trees are some of them are over 1,500 years old, and I spent a lot of time. And the deeper you go in the swamp that I grew up in, the less bugs there are, the cleaner the water is. It's a beautiful place. That's all this stuff is going to rent at the same time I'm trying to talk, and that's just the way it goes. All right, so I'm going to put this in. We're going to temper this at uh, almost 400, but not quite. And I'm going to do this at three cycles. It's about an hour and a half each cycle. And then tomorrow, uh, we will work on the handle. So you don't have to wait until tomorrow. We'll get in the TARDIS and just time travel. So we're here in tomorrow. For you, it's today. But for me, it's tomorrow. And um, I'm going to go back and show you what I did in the future to make this video possible for you in the present. What was I talking about? Uh, yesterday, the future. Going to the future to finish the thing so that I could come back in the past and share it with you. I don't know. I'm not smart enough.